So this just gives you a little example of what I'll go through some of our influenza surveillance plan as well as um, a case example that, that Sue has already alluded to here with the variant virus. Some of our communications that have surrounded this and it's been interesting doing this presentation at USAHA in the fall to now because we've had the change in the, in the naming of the virus which has been encouraging to see that progression. So prior to 2009 there was collaborative work ongoing between public health and animal health to develop a pilot influenza surveillance program and, and Dr. Lisa Becton was involved in that. But the identification of the pandemic 2009 virus um, really accelerated that surveillance plan. And you can see here some that's some of the new terminology surrounding that. They also address that a little differently. And the goal of this uh, surveillance plan was to get a broad range of isolates from industry to determine what was out there. And then we can see how that relates to public health. The specific objectives, and I think Troy has gone through this, but really we're, again, I'll just go through them, to monitor the evolution of endemic influenza in swine to better understand um, the emerging virus ecology, to make available these isolates through uh, GenBank for research and establish a database for analysis, and then to select these isolates for the development of specific diagnostic reagents, being able to update those in vaccine stocks. So having that available is a really important part of this program. The public health link, of course, as Sue already talked about, is to further this research, um, to be able to sensitize the human health surveillance network, and to collaborate with animal health to ensure coordinated risk communication when necessary. And we'll talk a little bit about how we've seen that happen um, in the last couple months, or actually I should probably say the last year. So again, Troy talked about this, but the plan has three streams. We have uh, case compatible ones that are submitted by a veterinarian, so that would be a clinically ill animal with on-farm influenza-like surveillance. Those at points of concentration like auctions, markets, fairs, and then when we have a situation where there's an epidemiological or suspected epidemiological link to a human case. The way this works is that results are reported into the USDA surveillance system by the National Animal Health Laboratory networks as either anonymous or traceable data. So this is something that is indicated by when the sample is submitted by the veterinarian or by the producer. Once the virus is isolated, it's placed in the NVSL repository and then selected virus isolates are sequenced and entered in GenBank. So we saw some of that through Troy, some of the viruses that have been isolated and that is ongoing with those that are waiting to be sequenced. And from there we can have public health, industry and others can monitor GenBank for the sequences of interest for their purposes. So to date, we have 37 National Animal Health Laboratory networks that are testing or are able to test samples for swine influenza virus surveillance. Over two years, we've had more than 2,000 accessions and almost 7,000 samples have been tested. And the number of samples, and you saw in that graph, we'll look at it again, submitted um, for testing increased sharply in November 2010. The non-quarterly, um, for those of you who don't get it, it is, our, it is our reporting system. Um, it's a publication that comes out quarterly. The last one was in December 2011, so we should have one soon. And this just shows the accessions or the herds, uh, accessions being in quotations or in parentheses there between for 2010 to June 2011. So we can see here that um, the blue is 2011 and the white is 2010 and you can see how we've had an increase here and this was the launch of the plan in October 2010 so we had a sharp increase in submissions in 2000 in November of 2010 and then again we've already seen this graph but this just gives um, the accessions the ones that were positive the virus isolations that were positive and then the ones that have been subtyped and again, we've seen this, but again, a breakdown of the different subtypes that we're seeing, um, those that are typically circulating in the swine herds, as well as some with the H1N1 pandemic. And Troy mentioned there was some mixed ones in there, so that's a small part of that in there right now. 
Just to give you an idea, the pork industry outreach surrounding this in 2010, we distributed brochures to all of our producers um, to encourage participation in this program. It was also sent to all the state veterinarians and their public health counterparts. And what we did see was this coincided with an increase in some of the submissions that we saw that peak in November 2010. The American Association of Swine Veterinarians, um, through Harry, also sent out a brochure to all of their AASV members and their students. So what I'll do is just move into a little bit now that we've gotten the background on that, on um, the animal and public health partnership that we've seen evolve since we put this program in place. So for a case example, and we've already talked a bit about this, in the second half of 2011, we saw that some U.S. residents were found to be infected with a variant virus, um, primarily the H3N2 variant virus. And Sue has already given a nice um, visual of that, that it's a reassortant that contains components of human, avian, swine, and H1N1 influenzas. So between, again, August 2011 and December 2011, there were 12 CDC-reported human cases. We haven't seen any cases identified since then. And public health and animal health officials, what we really saw here was work closely to monitor influenza in both those populations. On September 2011, there was an MMWR, which was an early release, and you can see here this um, demonstrates the change that we've seen in the virus naming. So this was the swine origin influenza A virus infection in two children in Indiana and Pennsylvania. So that was our first official report there um, as an MMWR. Sue's already talked about this. What was... Um, the variant part of this virus was the triple reassortment from swine, and then it contained the M matrix gene from the H1N1 2009 pandemic. And that just goes through that again. What followed was that we saw a collaborative and a coordinated response from both animal health and public health. Animal health, in this case, the children had been at a fair um, that had had swine at the fair, and so we had animal health follow up with the exhibitors at the fair. They held education sessions and awareness sessions for exhibitors at upcoming fairs because we had some of those, those um, swine moving to other fairs or else from the same farms going to other fairs. And they were prepared to sample and test at points of concentration. Public health, on the other hand, followed up with close contacts to the cases, so they did the investigation on the human side and did perfect prospective human surveillance at the upcoming fairs. So we saw surveillance and coordinated response on both animal health and public health counterparts. Um, information sharing, as Sue, sh Sue said, what typically happens is there's frequent conference calls as, as we go through this between um, state as well as federal animal health, public health, the industry, and this filters down through various points of contact. So the industry will, will be contacted by USDA, and we share that with um, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians and our state associations. And what we really saw was a successful application of the influenza surveillance program as well as the response plans from this. Um, some of the more activities, we've already alluded to this, but we, we wanted to um, talk a little bit more. We had the opportunity to visit with CDC in the fall, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, and typically we've done this in the past. We've sat down and discussed the surveillance plan. This was the first time um, we went a little more in depth. We brought our communications people and talked about influenza communications and um, the importance and significance of that to the industry. And that was a good discussion. Um, uh, we went a lot longer than we thought, and we had a really active discussion. And as that went on, at the international level, the FAO, OIE, and WHO had discussions following this and came out with the standardization of terminology. So that was standardization for variant A H3N2 viruses, so those infecting humans. And, you know, in terms of the impact for the pork industry, what, what we communicated or talked a little bit about was just the impact that H1N1 had and the importance of being able to have messages that are, um, that really focus on the importance of the issue, what, what is important to know and not necessarily are dictated or, or address a certain species. So what we saw with the new naming convention was when an influenza virus that normally circulates in swine 
but not people is detected. It's called a variant influenza virus. So this is what I believe we'll see coming forward. And there's still discussions ongoing about the naming of these viruses and other types of um, variant viruses that we see. But in this case, for example, if a swine origin influenza A H3N2 is detected in a person, that virus will be called an H3N2 variant virus or H3N2V. So that's typically what you've been seeing come out since that, which was around um, January 2012. So looking back at all this, some of our conclusions is that the timely sequencing of isolates is important to monitor the endemic influenza in swine. This is central to animal health, but it's also central to public health. Central to select proper isolates so that we can have the relevant reagents as well as updating the reagents and the seed stocks. And as Sue alluded to, knowing that, that the human health population can also monitor this and be prepared on that side, and we share actively back and forth between public health and animal health. Aligning of human and animal health messaging is important and should be focused on the appropriate terminology and the key points for the audience that they're being communicated with to understand the situations and the best practices for prevention. And it's encouraging to see this. And we're still moving forward and working on some of those communication messages. What happens now? Well, we have ongoing surveillance efforts on both sides, animal health and public health. Uh, a continued dialogue and partnership, which has been very encouraging and will continue onwards. Um, we're seeing increased sequencing of the isolates, and we'd like to see more analysis of that data to understand if we see differences in regions as well as communication of the surveillance data to producers and other stakeholders as part of the Swine and Swenza Surveillance Program. So moving forward, meeting those animal health objectives of the surveillance program is some of the next steps, and using this potentially as a model for comprehensive swine disease surveillance.